My name's Trip Humphreys. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an R&D staff at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the Sensors and Embedded Systems Group. Um, I'd like to talk today about some of the applications we have going on in the group. So I like to use SDRs for sensing um, and some of the different things that we're doing there. Um, uh, first, I'd like to just acknowledge like all the people that are working on these projects. Um, we have huge teams of people um, from all over the lab, physicists, chemists, software engineers, materials engineers, um, and all that. Um, so Oak Ridge National Laboratory is uh, just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, um, right here. We're a DOE laboratory, um, but we do other work in defense as well, uh, along with other companies. Um, is uh, Derek around real quick? Just gonna ask him how to turn off the auto advance. That's, uh, I'll figure that out. Um, so Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we have about 4,000 uh, researchers there. Um, kind of swells in the summer um, when all the interns come in. It's a little quieter in the fall and spring. Um, it's uh, about a billion and a half dollars of uh, uh, expenditures every year. Um, we're very diverse in the type of research that we do, so you might have seen some news lately about Summit has just gone online, which is the biggest supercomputer in the world. Uh, we do materials research, neutron research, uh, and then sensing and whatnot. So, um, so at the lab, um, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't like using SDRs, and every time a project comes up, I try to ask, can we use an SDR to replace uh, network analyzers, um, or common custom or test equipment that's usually used. I have two projects that I'd like to show today. Uh, one is on a carbon fiber measurement system, so we're trying to infer properties of the carbon fiber. Um, and one is on surface acoustic wave sensors um, for wireless sensing. Um, so this first uh, system is a carbon fiber measurement system. Uh, right here on the left, you can see kind of the carbon fiber toe on the production line. Um, it's just one continuous line of fiber um, before they would uh, use it for the end-use application. So at uh, Oak Ridge National Labs, we have a facility called the Carbon Fiber Technology Facility. Its purpose is to demonstrate low-cost carbon fiber conversion methods um, using textiles as a precursor, uh, so like a polyacryl nitrile. It looks like kind of like a, almost sheets of cotton, uh, white cotton at the beginning. It goes through this, uh, it's about 100 yards processing line where it goes through various thermal processes. Um, and out the end, uh, we get uh, carbon fiber. Uh, Derek, can I ask you a question? How do you turn off the auto advance on this thing? It's like advancing. Sorry about that. Very So uh, at various points, the, the, the fiber will have different material properties. Um, where we're interested in is right after uh, the oxidation furnaces, where the conductivity really changes. Um, so you can see stuff show up um, on a microwave type measurement. Uh, kind of the background for this project. So a lot of carbon fiber material is wasted every year. 10 to 20% is just lost. Uh, so it goes through this whole process of converting um, this precursor material to a carbon fiber. At the end, they take the carbon fiber, take it to the lab, measure it. If it doesn't meet their requirements or specifications, they throw it all away. And it takes like 24 hours from start to finish to get to the point where they can measure it. Um, so it's an offline measurement. It's very long lead time before you get any results. Um, they desire a, a real-time feedback control. So currently there aren't any measurement systems that would sit on a carbon fiber production line to measure it. It's gotta be non-contact, so a wireless measurement. The fiber is uh, very fragile on the production line. You could just break it with your hands. Um, and we wanna provide direct or inferred observations to steer process line parameters. So is the oxidation furnace too high, too low? Are there other parts um, that we can optimize there? Uh, so this is the, the concept measurement. Um, our measurement concept here. So um, 
back when the project started, um, the, they were saying, okay, can we send kind of gigahertz frequencies through the toe and measure attenuation, and does that attenuation correlate to any mechanical properties? Um, so on the right here is the proposed system. Um, it uses a, a transmit and a reference uh, software radio, a power splitter to split the signal. Um, so half the power goes back to the reference, half goes through the device under test, which would be a carbon fiber, and then we measure the attenuation uh, on a receiver. Um, the general concept is to emulate a scalar network analyzer um, just as a prototype to see, to see if we get anything um, worth looking at. The system prototype is two B200s with a mini circuits power splitter. Uh, this top one up here uh, generates a test tones at different frequencies, and then reference is guided back here and then sent out through some probes through the toe. Um, we use GNU radio to generate the tone and interact with the radios um, in Python. Uh, the bottom right here is just kind of a test of the system. Um, so I had a circuit laying around that had a 915 megahertz filter and amplifier. In blue and uh, green, or so in blue is the network analyzer uh, measurement. Um, and red is just what we got from measuring with this system as it scanned through frequencies. So, you know, it measures the passband ripple. It was pretty close in amplitude, you know, so a small calibration was required. But overall, I was pretty happy about that. Um, so for the experiment, um, they ran the process line with kind of exaggerated process variables um, to make the conductivity change a lot or, or some other uh, um, properties. Um, we have a probe, um, two waveguide probes, so we just direct the energy through the toe and measure the attenuation. Uh, we had four samples that we measured, T1, 6, 9, and 10. So one would be when we started up the process, six with some adjustments to line tension, line speed, nine, they adjusted um, the furnace by 100 degrees, and then T10 is when it reached that set point. Uh, if you look on the bottom left here is the carbon fiber samples, so visually you can't really see anything, they look identical, um, so that's where we're trying to use these measurements to see where the differences lie. And here are results from taking those measurements. So it took about 150 measurements of three different spots on each toe. Um, on the bottom here is uh, three different graphs showing um, laboratory measurements, resistivity, tensile strength, and linear density, and then our attenuation measurements. So what I'm looking for is um, separation in the vertical axis on the attenuation. Um, something that I can correlate to a uh, process parameter. Um, so you see linear uh, density on the bottom right, uh, almost a pretty linear relationship. That's kind of to be expected. You know, if it's thicker, uh, we expect more attenuation. Um, these other ones, we, we get separation um, uh, vertically. Um, we don't expect too much between these two samples because it was just kind of line and speed adjustments, but I do expect uh, big differences between the blue and the green here because of the temperature changes. Um, so overall, um, pretty encouraging results, um, just as a prototype demonstration. Um, uh, up here on the top right is just the linear correlation measurements. Um, so it might not be a linear correlation that's the best fit for this data, but hopefully um, we'll find some better ways to look at that in the future. So the next steps for this project, uh, better statistical analysis of the data. Um, right now we're averaging um, these sweeps in the five to six gigahertz range, um, and, but that may be masking some spectral features of the toe. Uh, it's probably a good opportunity to apply machine learning techniques. Maybe we can find some separation or clustering of the data that makes sense. Um, a frequency sweep analysis. Um, Another interesting part will be in situ measurements, so actually installing it on the production line and providing measurements. And, and then probably phase uh, measurements, maybe reflection as well. Uh, there could be something hiding there. Um, so bottom right here, this, this stack here is that material um, before it's converted and then the carbon fiber coming out of the oxidation furnace there. 
Um, so overall, pleased with how it is now. We uh, are, are uh, a little bit of additional funding to look at these next steps and hopefully, hopefully provide some more, uh, more meaningful data to the engineers who work at the CFTA. So I'm going to switch gears here to the SOL sensor interrogation system. This is another um, group of projects that I've been working on at the lab. So there's been a lot of interest in wireless sensing for um, kind of power grid applications as well as national security applications. Um, so the system consists of uh, a transceiver and wireless sensors. Um, and so we're sending out a, 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 a high frequency burst, listening for the echo off the sensors and processing them to extract data. Um, a little background on surface acoustic wave devices. Uh, these are solid state devices, typically used for filtering or delay lines. Uh, you can incorporate very complex signal processing in a small size. Um, it's quite literally a spatial mapping of a time function. If you look at the diagram on the bottom, this would be like a delay line filter. You have an input transducer, an output transducer, and acoustic wave that travels between the two. Um, if you look closely, uh, the overlap of these, these interdigitated fingers form uh, kind of a rectangle. Um, so it's a rect function in time. If you looked at it in frequency, you'd get a sync function output. Um, if you can imagine adjusting the overlap of those fingers to look like a sync function, you get kind of a brick wall filter. Um, there's billions of these devices produced each year. Mostly, like I said, filters, delay lines, resonators, and more recently, sensors and RFID. SOL sensors, um, a lot of times are implemented as one port device, so measure the reflected signal off of the sensor and process that to um, determine how the frequency shifted or the time delay shifted. Um, a lot of times it'll be kind of thought of as a cooperative radar target, so I know the design of my sensor, um, what frequencies I expect to get back nominally. Um, once I get that back, I look, what changed? How does it relate to some physical parameter? And relate that back to a sensor measurement. Typically 10 to 10 megahertz, three gigahertz operation. Uh, fabrication tolerances kind of limit um, how well you can build these devices using standard uh, photolithography. Uh, the feature size scales um, with the frequency, so they get very small. 915, they're typically right about a micron in feature size. Um, and there's a variety of device embodiments, so inherently these devices are temperature and strain sensitive. Uh, if you bend it, you can see a velocity shift uh, of the acoustic wave. Chemical and gas detection by applying some kind of sensitive thin film to the top of the substrate. Uh, resonant or delay line embodiments. And they're naturally radiation, I would, I would say tolerant. Um, they'll still be kind of uh, crystal damage from radiation, but uh, it doesn't rely on the same phenomena as silicon. Uh, some of the sensors that we're working on, HF gas dissimilar, so hydrogen fluoride gas, um, uh, using silica deposit on the reflectors and tracking a mass loading shift um, and viscoelasticity. Um, methane gas detection, so that would be something that would go in a transformer for power grid applications um, where they want to see off-gassing in the oils uh, as a way to determine age or failure modes. And then temperature, um, so just remotely measuring temperature. The interrogation systems and the ones that we're uh, implementing with the radio um, often approach from uh, a radar perspective. So um, you can use a modified form of the radar equation to get the signal to noise ratio. Um, the things you also have to consider are the antenna on the sensor. Uh, the sensor has some insertion loss, you know, so that could be another 10 to 20 dB of loss there, um, and, and a few other things as well. Um, but then exploit all the other radar techniques to improve that, so pulse compression gain, averaging, um, and then you know, power output in your hardware as well. Um, there's interrogation signal considerations. So um, the one that's typically done and that I've used in the past is just a swept frequency chirp. Um, so sweep a frequency that excites the entire sensor bandwidth. Um, get back all that information and process it. Um, it's got a fairly fat, flat um, frequency response, but high autocorrelation side lobes, so post-processing can be kind of messy. Um, the one that 
Um, we've implemented now is a, a noise radar type architecture, uh, so you use random modulation. Um, you get suppressed range ambiguity. So this is nice in a multi-sensor environment where we have sensors in discrete time slots and frequency windows, um, so they don't over, overlap and uh, interfere with each other. Uh, and then reduce mutual interference, so when we have a lot of interrogation systems and sensors, um, maybe it's a little bit better for that scenario as well. So we've implemented this part uh, on a B200 Mini FPGA. Um, we want to exploit as much bandwidth as we can, so we offload um, the generation of the transmit uh, signal to the FPGA and then synchronize that to um, uh, the receiver. Um, so we have a, a couple of custom blocks in here, a pseudo-random sample generator that feeds the transmit side, um, sets flags uh, when I want it to start listening. Um, and then this trickles back the full data rate at a slower rate so that we can capture that full uh, frequency response. The pseudo-random sample generator uses an array of uh, linear feedback shift registers, so each sample bit in the transmit chain is fed by a different shift register network. Um, they're all seeded differently. Um, uh, so on the left is a diagram of what that would look like. Um, and through simulation, uh, we kind of verify that, okay, we get a uniform uh, generation of sample values, and the central limit theorem, we get a Gauss Gaussian response when we sum those values. Um, so it looks good for that. Um, and then implement it in the FPGA and look at the output spectrum. Um, so I expect a uh, flat, uh, nice flat spectrum over a, a, a long observation um, over the whole sampling bandwidth there and we're using a 32 megahertz bandwidth in somewhat of an effort to sit in the 915 megahertz ISM band. Um, for these signals, so when you get this response back, you, 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 you have the loss of the sensor, the loss of um, the propagation loss, just getting to the sensor, and all these other effects that you have to compensate for. Um, so I thought I'd try to show the signals here and, and what's going on. Um, to illustrate uh, what we're looking at. So starting on the left over here is a, a, an example of a received signal. So this first big burst is I capture the transmitted noise burst. Um, I use that burst, gate it out, and then uh, deconvolve the transmit signal um, um, here uh, just to the right. So what you see here is you know kind of this, this impulse roll off and then I expect the sensor response to be here, but you don't see it yet because the signal noise ratio is so low for just a single um, burst, and you don't get a complete picture with the noise. So we average, and you can average hundreds to thousands depending on what your um, environment looks like um, or how far away from the sensor you want to be. Um, so after thousands of averages, you see the sensor response come out of the noise right here. Um, we apply a match filter to that. Um, so the match filter is just a series of rect functions to somewhat approximate the device response. Um, and then we scale that response to the physical measurement we want to take. So for instance, uh, the sensor might be sensitive to temperature at 94 parts per million per degree C. So we scale the frequencies and time delay to approximate that. We multiply this response by all the match filters and then integrate each of those data sets to see which one has the most energy, which one is the closest match to what we expect, and take that as our measurement. Um, and then, so here's what these signals look like as we're averaging, so from one to 1,000. One, you kind of get this spread out, noisy looking signal. Um, if you were taking measurement, it'd, it'd be very high variation um, in what you're trying to do. And then up to 1,000, you push your noise floor down, your sensor signal starts to come out, you get a very stable noise, or a very stable measurement. Uh, for temperature, you know, it can be a couple tenths of a degree to hundredths of a degree um, precision. Um, there. Hardware as well is an important uh, factor. So um, we designed a, a daughter board for the B200 Mini. Uh, it's got a power amplifier and an LNA. Um, TRX switch to switch the transmit and receive channels between a single antenna. Um, so it's just got a 
pretty basic layout. Um, transmit through power amplifier. You can switch between um, just straight through or through a saw filter. And then uh, mini circuits, high speed RF switch that switches the interrogation antenna between that. Um, back through an LNA, the same filter here, and then received by the radio. Um, so we got some flexibility there. Um, it was designed to fit kind of on top, um, get a little bit of extra output power, um, a little bit better sensitivity on the received sensor. Um, this is the interrogation system as it stands right now. It uh, integrates uh, post-processing on an UDU x86, uh, apparently embedder system, embedded system. Um, it's got pretty good specs for a small embedded board. It's uh, this top right board up here. Uh, the B200 Mini and the daughter board sit here, and then just various cabling and whatnot. Uh, bottom left, you can see the B200 Mini with the daughter board um, there, the, the transmit receive antenna, and then um, this connection here is um, uh, controlling the RF switch through the FPGA, um, through the GPIO pins. Um, and just as a demonstration of some measurements, so we took the system and some temperature sensors to an anechoic chamber, um, measured various distances, various antennas. So I have a monopole, a Yagi, and a, pa a patch panel antenna. Um, uh, below each one of those is the standard deviation of the measurement that we receive. So um, for a low gain antenna, you can see sensors um, and you know, obviously more directions but you'll be limited in the range and the sensor precision, so maybe out to a meter or two um, and a few degrees of variation. Uh, these high gain antennas, uh, as far as we could go, you know, we could only go out to five meters. That was the length of the, the chamber. Um, so you, you can get uh, the same variation in measurements up to five meters in range, probably even farther if we would test that. Next steps here, um, ruggedize the interrogator system for outdoor use. So we're planning to deploy, within the next year, the system at a power utility to measure, to do remote temperature measurements, kind of see what systems need to be in place to take these measurements, and then hopefully, hopefully integrate the chemical sensors uh, into the transformers. Improve the daughter board design, so more output power, get more range, better measurements. Uh, and then remote control and central data collection so that we can see what's going on. Um, and don't have to manually or physically be at that location. Uh, and then the system on the right here, so on the left is a sensor, um, the system, and then post-processing on a laptop. So in conclusion, um, you know, SDR, obviously it's a great asset um, for sensing and instrumentation. It's been very helpful uh, at the lab for rapid prototyping, um, kind of to come back to what Mark was talking about earlier. Uh, GNU Radio in Python allows me to prototype much faster than building um, custom hardware, custom software, and I don't have to go find a VNA that does what I want it to. Uh, it's much more rugged. Um, this, uh, I forgot to mention the carbon fiber. Um, it's kind of got the texture of cat hair, and it's extremely conductive, and it gets sucked into fans. And we blew up like $50,000 worth of equipment when we started this, so it's nice that the, the radios can be ruggedized to, you know, there's a reason we don't want to take the network analyzer um, out to these locations. Um, just want to give a shout out, so Adam Anderson is another ORNL researcher. Um, he's doing a presentation on Wednesday on machine learning modems. Uh, I've seen a demo of it uh, pretty recently, it's very cool, so I hope everyone can check that out. And uh, thanks, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Trip. All right, while we're taking questions, it would be good if Martin, you got lavaliered. But uh, we have another one, I think, if you could go back to the back. You're, talk you're, talk you're speaking next, right? Okay, yeah, do you have a lavalier? The, the wireless mics, the one, the lapel mic. Yeah, okay, yeah, could you go back there? All right, we're good, all right, great. Uh, questions, for I don't know why I came up here. I have to run around the mic. All right, Raphael. Um, your method of pulling the signal from the noise floor, do you have any references for that, or what is that called? Is that... Uh, the averaging? Or? Yeah, sort of the whole process that you're doing. Um, so it'd, it'd be kind of like a coherent averaging radar system. So okay. uh, 
uh, you pull up any kind of uh, radar or textbook. Um, okay. s same methods are applied to this system. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Dan. When you're doing the coherent averaging technique, are you uh, relying on the fact that the sensor is giving the same reading over that that averaging period, or? So that's a good question. Um, so you can only assume that, I mean, if the environment's changing and the, the, the sensor's changing, you know, you'll start to average out some of those effects. Um, so over a short enough time period, you know, so a thousand averages, you know, we capture in milliseconds. So on that short of a time frame, the temperature might not change very much. Um, over a longer time frame, um, something, it, it just depends on the application. So, um, you know, like a five or 10,000 average might only take a few seconds, so. Other questions? Oh, all the way back. What happened, do we have the second handheld? As in, do we have it? Oh, it's right there. Would somebody mind grabbing, uh, I'm gonna pick somebody, Dan. Can you run the mic on that side for me? Thanks, okay. Who was it over here? Two of them, okay. Yuha, hello. Thank you for the awesome presentation. Um, I have a question about this range Doppler match filter bank uh, that you implemented with FPGA. Mm -hmm. Is it open source? The FPGA code is, n I don't think it's posted anywhere, but I, we definitely could make it posted, I think. Um, cool. So it, it basically implements the noise generation. Um, there's a TRX select to select between chirp and that, and then, um, uh, synchronization for the receive, so I get the same t equals zero every time. So, but are you doing? Are you doing the match filtering on the match the filtering FPGA? is on the post is post processed after the fact on the general purpose oh, okay. processor. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it would be an interesting project to put it on the FPGA. It'd be so much faster. So. Mm -hmm. Quick question about that daughter board you made for the B two hundred. How hard was it to get that TR uh, switch to work? Because it seems like it would have to switch really quickly for such short range interrogation. It, it does, so, so the, the noise burst is a microsecond long, just to give some context. I listen for about 10 microseconds, so I wanna uh, turn it on and off around that noise burst um, to kind of keep the, the receive chain from getting drowned out. Um, so that switch, I believe, has a 50 nanosecond switching time. Um, so it's fast enough for this, and, and, and I can gate that out as well in post-processing. Um, so yeah, quick, it's a quick switch. Mm -hmm. Oh, is there a question right here? Yeah. What kind of waveguide probes we're using on the uh, fiber measurements, and I assume those, that's the absolute attenuation normalized that, that is to normalized, through. yes. Okay. Um, so those are, those are rectangular uh, WR-187, so... Huge. Uh, yeah. Was a five to six gigahertz kind okay. of range, so um, just kind of an open slot on each end. Any um, polar, any uh, uh, polarization on the there, fiber? There is, okay. yeah. yeah. So if I, if you take the, the carbon fiber and rotate it, don't really see much. So okay, okay. Um, we we kind of find the most sensitive uh, direction. Mm -hmm. Any other questions in the audience? Oh, we got several. David. Yeah, it looked like on both applications you're amplifying the TX. Is that correct? Yeah, amplifying the TX. Um, what's the sort of power you're needing? Um, so right now it's about uh, 100 milliwatts. Um, I'm keeping it kind of low because of the uh, kind of Sorry, is that 100 milliwatts to drive the amplifier or 100 milliwatts? Uh, 100 milliwatts out of the antenna. Out of the antenna, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'd like to be higher, maybe plus 20 or plus 30 dBm, that'd be nice. Um, but the, it's more of like, what's, how do we actually get the sensor measurements right now instead of, you know, optimizing the performance, so. Awesome, you, see, you had a question? I have a question about the temperature measurement. Uh, how do you measure the temperature? Are you using a wireless temperature sensor or you are using the signal to measure, like the. Oh, what what signal are we looking at? Yes, how how are you how are you doing it? Uh, um, so we, we send out this this transmit burst. Um, the sensor has an antenna on it. Um, it gets absorbed into the device, which converts um, that electromagnetic signal to an acoustic. There's reflectors on the devices that bounce that signal back out, which kind of encodes the information as well. And, and then we listen for that echo off the device. 
I think we maybe have time for one more question. Is there any more from the audience? Nope, perfect. Okay, thank you so much, cool. Trip. Thank you.